Mkamsa. Okay. All right. How's that? Mkamsa. Is that is that am I doing a good job? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um today I will be co-hosting with um with Jupiter and and it will be it will be me and Jupiter all the way from India and I'm in South Africa. And before we begin I'd like to just introduce um our guest speaker today a, a little bio about what um she's she's doing um she's involved in chemistry and chemistry is a branch of of science concerned with substances with of which matter is composed the investigation of the properties and reactions and the use of such reactions to form new substances and we have chemistry all around us there's everything that we have everything that is around in your home the pen that you are using in school is involves chemistry and chemists investigate the properties of matter at the level of atoms and molecules they measure the proportions and reaction rates in order to understand the unfamiliar substances and how they behave or to create new compounds to use and our jupi can you please go back to the previous slide no the one after this one thank you yes there we go and our our guest speaker as i'm so excited i'm so sorry I, i'm so excited i've i've i did um just a little distraction side thing on i did chemistry in 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 high school and i was doing um science expos at some point i wanted to be a chemist but i decided now nah, this is just too hard let me just <laughs> and i ventured into something else so i'm just excited to actually hear someone who's who's into the field and who will be explaining more to uh the little girl <laughs> the me the little girl that was just thinking of chemistry back then is probably someone else who's going through the same process um professor marian kansa is a faculty member of the department of chemistry at the kwame nkrumah university of science and technology in kumasi ghana her work involves designing methods of investigation of soil air water food etc for pollutants and contaminants and predict the potential risk associated with exposure to toxic substances she has a passion for mentorship outreach capacity build and capacity building she is also involved in advocacy science diplomacy and she enjoys writing and dancing <laughs> i hope she can i hope you can um do a few moves for for us at the end of the show <laughs> cuz she enjoys the dancing um we have we have a couple of questions um constructed for 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 the for our speaker for today and i think we can go on to start the very the first question do we do you have any questions that you want to ask before we can proceed no no let's go ahead oh okay the first things first i would like to know and i i believe that we all want to know what is can you please elaborate what is the field that you're doing what is chemistry i think your your mic is your mic is is can you please unmute your mic i think your mic is off yeah you you have defined it quite well the what i will call the textbook uh, definition but uh, what i do is one aspect of chemistry which is environmental chemistry so it's a look at the everything around us and the interactions thereof so when in your introduction of me when you talk about the interaction of um, chemical substances in water in air soil and in atmosphere and elsewhere uh, that basically the environment and so my specific area of research or study is to look at 
either toxic or even non-toxic essential elements that are found in the environment at large and how they are either of benefit to us or are harmful to us. And then if they are harmful most of the time, then I look at eight ways in which they are harmful, the extent to which they could harm us, and then I advise accordingly. And so that's basically what I do. And in a few instances, I also look at remediation methods, that is cleanup, assuming a place is polluted with some of these toxic elements or substances. How do you clean up? Maybe as a result of an industrial activity like mining, or something like that. So, in the, I think in the layman's words, this is how I would define what I do. You know, when you're thinking of of all the, the, the well, of when you're thinking as a kid, okay, now I'm talking as uh, looking at the young girl somewhere in the world. You're thinking of science, like you're thinking of chemicals. How did you get to the point of thinking that I want to venture into the environmental side of chemistry? I want to look into how how did you. What inspired you? Okay. Let me put it this. What inspired you? Yeah, to I I will be I'll be lying to you if I told you I knew this when I was younger. I knew I would do this. No, <laughs> I didn't know I'll be doing this when I was younger. But I knew I'll be doing something that will make a difference. I always knew I'll be standing before people and doing something to make an impact and make a difference. So that is, let's say, at age three to five. And then whilst I was growing older, I was curious about things around me. I grew up on a school compound, so we had lots of um, trees around. And I spent a lot of my afternoons with my siblings in the woods, you know, chasing flies, butterflies, and all sorts of creatures that you might find in the woods. So that opened up my imagination and I asked a lot of questions. So I think it became a matter of consequence that when it was time for me to go to high school, this curious mind who is always asking questions or should do science. It, it, there was no question about that. It just happened that I would choose science because of how curious I was. So at until secondary school, I was doing science. I think I toyed with the possibility of doing pharmacy, but I, I ended up doing chemistry. And then chemistry, it was in the final year, the fourth year of my study, that the interest in the environment really, as in branching into environmental, environmental chemistry, became very strong because I realized that environmental chemists apply the basic principles in the major branches of chemistry that is organic, inorganic, physical, and analytical chemistry, a bit of each of the major branches uh, find a place in the applications in environmental chemistry in solving environmental problems. So that is how I ended up trying to integrate all the aspects of chemistry in solving society's uh, needs in, in terms of the environment. I don't know if I've answered you enough. <laughs> I think that's beautiful because a lot of times we uh, get just scared of science without, I mean, we don't really uh, think of it as connected to what we see all around. We just get scared of, I mean, that's what happened to me. I, I was so scared of science all my life. So that's- uh, Please, the, the volume is a bit low now. Okay, so. and I was saying I was just always been scared of science. So um, this has been like really inspiring for me. So from our previous shows, we have learned that there are very few women in STEM careers. Is it the same in your sector as well? Yeah, actually in the Department of Chemistry where I work now, that is where I also did my undergraduate studies. And at the time I, I completed in 2002, up to that time, there was no woman faculty or female faculty in that department. So we were, taught predominantly by males, except courses like English and other, what we call elect, uh, elective courses that had some female interaction. But in the core courses of chemistry at the time, there was no female. 
but then one of my mates and I were the first females to be recruited to join the faculty. And since then, we've had an addition. So currently, there are three of us, and we form about 12% of the total faculty of the Department of Chemistry. So there's been an improvement, but um, personally, I, my, my, my path, my story, it's not a typical uh, female in science story where there are so many struggles and there is antagonism in your face. And I, I have been very fortunate. I have had support. I have worked my part. I have worked hard. And I, I want to also acknowledge uh, the male colleagues that they have been supportive. I haven't seen antagonism in my direct department. But interestingly, I think the general social perceptions of what a female should do, I encountered that on a daily basis with visitors who come in. There's been uh, occasions where I, not more than once, where I have been mistaken as a secretary instead of the person who owns the office. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I take these cells uh, in my stride and I, I smile about them because I, I think it's a reflection of the society's thinking. And so I always use the opportunity to educate and, and not to take it too seriously. Yeah. No, but I mean, that is something we need to change with people just assume that women... Pardon? That, that is something, as a society, we need to change the assumption that women are not able to do certain yeah, things. Yeah, so I, I think the fact that there are currently three of us as women in the, in the department is, is a sign that the society itself is evolving. And all of us are involved in outreach. In the, in the bio that was read, I am very much involved in outreach, and so are my colleagues. And... Now we have a women in STEM group on campus. So all the women faculty and those in administration have come together and we organize workshops and girl camps and a lot of um, outreach programs to reach out to our immediate community and the entire society for them to know that the, 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 the trend is changing and the response has been very, very encouraging. In fact, these days, I think the drive to have women in science or to t send a girl child to school to do science started long ago when I was even a child. So, but then it, it takes long for society to completely shift. So the general perception has changed. A lot of girls are doing science, but they don't, as, as, some outsiders don't expect a young looking beautiful woman to be a chemist. <laughs> if I should be that blunt. So they are always short. It's, and especially when you are introduced with your surname, and, and so probably a woman, a man, and then you, you show up and you are tiny and you are young looking. And so that is a, a conflict for some people. But it's, 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 a, it's not a negative. I don't think it's negative. I get this even globally when I go outside the confines of Ghana. So I take it as one of those. Things. <laughs> yeah. I've actually had a bank manager who I was speaking with on phone for about three years, and he saw me in person. was like, oh, OK. You know, and you could tell that the perception of what he was expecting and what he saw was different. So. I think this is a global thing and yeah, definitely. what is good about it is the appreciation you see in people's faces when a woman is able to accomplish something instead of negativity or antagonism. Yeah. Of course. That, that is amazing. That really inspired me. Okay. But Bilba, would you like to ask the next question? Actually, I'm having problems with the sound. Let me see if I can. Oh. Oh, apologies, guys. I had a, a bit of a, a technical glitch, so I'm trying to catch up now. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. But I got. I I, I agree with you, Prof, about um, the misconception that when you're looking into um, fields, if you, if you, if a woman in the field of, of STEM, for example. Um, they're expecting you to be, I don't know, crusty and without makeup at some point and not looking, you know? I don't know. They just, they, there's that misconception that 
a pretty you need to be if in science you you need to be if you're pretty you should be doing something else uh maybe look at modeling or something in the beauty sector or do something like that so if you're pretty what are you doing in science what are you doing chemistry how did you get there you know it's and sometimes people don't take you seriously because of that Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of big role in that I, I, yeah. with chemistry they they they've got to take you seriously because <laughs> <laughs> of course initially the thinking of be like okay yes woman pretty but then in a split second they start taking you seriously because it's a field where you can't fake it it's it's it's, it's it's not a very easy path to walk so you will not go there and be playing games yeah so within a short time once you start delivering your science you you earn your place yeah yeah i love yeah. you said they have to take you seriously that's amazing i think generally as women i don't know maybe i should log out and then log back in is that okay because i'm having a struggle with hearing yeah and um, go ahead oh okay um i i you know the this thing um i don't know but this thing about why is it does it have to be so difficult for women and girls to pursue stem um careers do why is it so difficult why does, why do we have to prove ourselves because someone else uh, a male a male counterpart can just walk in the room and why am i It's better. It's better. Thank you. Oh, okay. It's better. Cool. Thank you. Uh, okay. I was just saying that why did a male counterpart walk into the room and say, "Hi, I'm Doctor So and So, or I am, I'm, I'm a pharmacist. I'm this." And then the the misconception people just go with the flow. But you, as a female, you just have to work hard and prove yourself that you're actually capable. of um of doing whatever it is that you say that you are capable of doing and unfortunately society I, i i just don't understand why we have to work so hard when we are probably in we in the same in the same um we have the same capability but as women we have to work so hard learn Can and Yeah. Yes, you can. Yes. Yeah, so I as I said, I think the the misconception in my case Hello, I can't see you guys. The, the misconception in my case okay, okay. is not from the it's not from colleagues but from outsiders. <laughs> from colleagues before you get to where i am you definitely would have paid your due and then they can read your profile so they know what you can do but as outsiders walking in for the first time uh, on about two occasions i've had people walk into a room i'm seated with two colleagues of mine they just assume that you are probably the secretary <laughs> yeah so i in that case i i i personally don't take offense they don't know so they will know and that takes about 1 minute or less to tell them that you are not the secretary <laughs> and then they go home educated and changed they are thinking change but in the field of work i think in, in our university environment in our field of work it's it's a university that is going to be 70 next year so we've come a long way and therefore um the women folk don't face that challenge they everybody knows that it it's competitive we don't just get employed because of your pretty face you go through a rigorous exercise like everybody else so it's normally outside as the the if i should use the words the ordinary person who doesn't know what happens in the place of work who might gen I think it's genuine that's the perception they have think that all oh, this woman probably is a secretary and but uh, as I said once you correct then it's it's done so it's not like 
Oh, even if you have corrected, then you still have to prove yourself. No, I have not had any occasion currently where I'm working where I had to do like 10 times to to be recognized. No, I, I'm very much myself, but I'm also aware of the general struggles of women elsewhere. And that is why I am part of outreach. I'm proud of it. And in fact, a lot these days, we have a lot of females in the medical school, a lot of females in engineering. But the interesting trend is that the, the retention for them to stay in science and apply science and do a PhD and become a professor, that is where the challenge is. Getting the girls to come do science these days is easy. A lot of parents have accepted and they understand and they know the importance. But getting them to stay... <laughs> is where the challenge is to stay and weather through the storm and get to the top and still remain in science in the practice of science sometimes the number keeps reducing as you go higher yeah so i think for us here that is and maybe the rest of africa and elsewhere i think globally the trend is about the same the the challenge to all of us is how to get women or how to create an environment that will make women feel comfortable enough to remain in a STEM field to retirement. So what advice would you give a young girl who wants to pursue a degree in chemistry? Hello. Hello. Yeah, what advice would you like to give a young girl who wants to pursue a degree in chemistry? Oh, if uh, they should believe in themselves. But I, one thing I tell youngsters these days is that you should know yourself first. Know the things you are good at. Know the things that come to you a bit naturally. So that you, if you have that natural flair, then it's easy to build on it. So a combination of nature. Nature, that is what you've been given. And then nature so you come to school so that what you have by nature will be nurtured so if you have a little bit of flair for it which is not natural inclination it makes the journey enjoyable but if it's something very very challenging to you right from the beginning and you still want to do it then the, the journey can be very uh, check it on the way but so identify a field that you naturally have a, a flair for so that when you go to school it's nurtured and then you enjoy the process and it's only when you enjoy the process that you will stay on course if you don't enjoy the process you will run away <laughs> you will abandon the ship when it gets too tough so young girls if you feel the you feel like Chemistry is something you want to do. You are curious about things around you. You want to contribute to solving problems of the environment, of building things, of creating new things. By all means, do science. And then as you go higher, specialize in chemistry. It's a very exciting field. I always tell my undergraduates that doing lab experiments is like cooking in the kitchen. And who else is naturally born to cook? than women <laughs> at least from where i sit traditionally the traditional role of cooking is for the women so if now you are going to school then cooking and then making a living out of cooking but a special way of cooking should not scare you at all <laughs> and basically it's cooking add this to that watch the temperature measure this sieve this dry that and that's all we do in the kitchen so just a sophisticated way of cooking <laughs> that is a most different way I've heard of putting chemistry, and that's amazing. And what you said is perfect because in India, at least, what I have seen, a lot of parents push their children to do certain fields that they were not able to do, and child just gets crushed under the pressure. And we have a lot of students who side to have all the pressure. So yeah, I think the heart part is really important for all of us. Babalda, would you like to ask a question? Oh, I was, I think we couldn't hear you. You were breaking there a little bit. I, I think you were, were you talking about peer pressure or, yeah. or peer pressure? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, your, your mic is a bit. Yeah, I'm sorry, okay. Hello, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I was saying was in India, at least we have a lot of 
maybe not fear pressure as you have parents pressure of parents pushing the children oh, and a lot of them because so we have a lot of stress there in children and a lot of children that commit suicide because of this um, so yeah following what i believe is really important oh yes the, well i would like to add on what she's saying there's a you know with there's a well i think with us i think it's a global thing that sometimes parents um pressure children to venture into things that mm-hmm. they too wanted to do yeah but they yeah. were unable to do right and um, yeah. sometimes yeah. maybe you, like for example like prob- you wanted to do something in environment you you know, then by na- <clears throat> sorry by nature you loved um, being in uh, in the in the woods and all of that and maybe something happens maybe your parents one of your parents say no instead of doing environmental chemistry how about you be a doctor go do yeah. be a doctor you know uh, i my parents are both retired educationists they were educators so fortunately for me <laughs> and my siblings they they understand the psychology of children and all that so there wasn't a single occasion where we were pushed i remember very well when my admission letter came for chemistry because i as i said i had wanted to do pharmacy at a point so when the letter came for chemistry i remember my dad would say you have two weeks to think about this if you want to pursue where to go ahead but once you sign that acceptance letter you are not turning back so think about it <laughs> and if you don't want to do it then you can wait and reapply the following year so i i had to make an informed decision at the age of 18 or younger and <laughs> yeah so that is the environment i grew up in but i appreciate that a lot of parents want to live their dreams in their children So currently from where I sit when young people and their parents approach me which happens all the time for guidance on how to get into the university any time the parents come with the children I say mommy daddy why don't you stay outside let me play with the kids <laughs> <laughs> then I start asking them what they want and then sometimes the story is completely different from what the parents had pro- approached you with so i discuss with them i tell them the prospects of what they want and all that and then i bring the parents in and i say okay why do you want this world to do this and they will also tell you their version of it then i i use the opportunity to educate them a bit that you know times have changed and these days it's not just about what you do in school but the passion with which you carry on professionally that is what is going to give you the contentment the satisfaction so i do that and then at the end of our discussion i always win and the children win too <laughs> in most cases because i think a lot of parents do that out of ignorance they mean well they kn- they want the best for their children it's just that it's a bit misguided the idea of what is good for the children might not be what they need to succeed so once a neutral person comes in and draws the attention to the bigger picture in most cases they they are cooperative and they allow the children to follow their path how oh, that's good sometimes in a varsity you find someone who's been who says um i don't know what to do but my parents said i should do this so they go and start probably first year second year they realize this is just really i don't like this i don't want to do this and they drop out some drop out some start again they 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 register for something new and it it sometimes it's just a, a waste of the child's time because they ventured into something that they didn't like they didn't want to do and some end up um dropping out because of such situations so we'd like not uh, um for a girl who is in 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 that situation who's just stepping into varsity who's never seen anything like that maybe in from the rural areas or um disadvantaged areas who's just doing something because they've been told to do um what do you say to to a child like that 
Well, if they haven't yet committed themselves into doing what they don't want to do, <laughs> they can look around their society to the people who, the opinion leaders who kind of matter and who are influential. It could be church, it could be the mosque, it could be the district office, wherever people gather that you find, it could be the chief. People gather that you think there's somebody who is a bit... Um, exposed and knows about happenings who can put in a word on your behalf to your parents that they should give you a chance in doing what you do and if they have examples even to show them that you know this thing your child wants to do this is the end result or the possible end result because as i said parents mean well they, they all their actions they think they're doing what is best for you based on what they know so if somebody, a neutral person within the community comes to them and opens their eyes to a new knowledge, a new thing, then they begin to appreciate what, what the child wants to do. But if they don't get that person, sometimes it's very, very difficult for the child that they have seen grow to convince them that <laughs> this is what I want and it's, it's good enough. The, the general perception of parents is that you, you are still not grown, you are still a child, you don't know any better. So if you have parents who think you don't know any better, you might have to approach someone in the community whom they respect to put in a word for you and to open their eyes to opportunities beyond what they are proposing for you, which you probably don't like. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Parents who usually think that you are not as grown up as, I mean, they have a hard time accepting you're grown up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as um, like in your uh, bio, you said that you work with contaminants and pollutants. So we've heard a lot of talk about microplastics right now. So how do they contaminate our food and how do they even reach our food? Yeah, so microplastics are plastics, but smaller particles of plastics, sometimes five millimeters in size or smaller. So some can be seen, some cannot be seen. And they are mostly found in the sea, in the ocean, because of damping, indiscriminate damping. And when they end up in the sea and in the soil and other parts of the environment, they tend to break down as a result of stress from the environment, pressure and the sun is also a very strong um, initiator of breakdown of plastics into microplastics. And these microplastics in the ocean or in the sea get eaten by fish or aquatic mm -hmm. animals. So they eat them and once they eat them and we humans also eat the fish, then the plastics end up in us because the plastics don't easily degrade. They eat them, but they don't digest like food will digest. So it will remain there. And then when you eat the fish, it will also remain in you. But because it's a foreign particle in your body, the body has a way of excreting it within a short time. Apart from fish or seafood, it's, it can also get onto your table through consumption of edible parts of plants, the root part, so carrots, mm. ginger, onions, and other roots, edible roots of plants have also been found to contain some microplastics as a result of absorption through the soil or the water. And so these plastics can end up on your table. The third option or the third route of exposure will be packaging, food packaging. If your food is packaged with plastic, there's also the possibility of tiny particles from the surface of the plastic entering that food. So when it enter, that's how it enters the food and then you eat and it enters your body. But it gets excreted. Most of it gets excreted. But the danger is that because plastic contains components that are potentially harmful, if the environment within your body is conducive for that component to be released, then you are likely to suffer from the potential harm of that harmful component. But currently, research has not yet confirmed in totality that when plastic enters a human body, the person will suffer 
the, 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 the harm that the potential components can cause because of the body's ability to excrete within a, a, a short time, within a day or so. But there's still research, it's still work in progress because we know plastics on, the, on themselves are toxic. And once they find themselves in the body, you cannot control the reactions that can occur. It's better not to find them there. But currently there is no direct research that links the consumption of plastics or the exposure of plastics to the potential diseases that the components of plastics can cause. So how do we, pre how do we prevent the contamination of food like that? I think the responsibility lies on all of us <laughs> as people, as human beings, as citizens of nations, as children listening, that we are responsible citizens in our disposal of plastic waste. So if plastic is properly disposed where the country, your community, your village expects you to dispose, then it will not end up in the ocean for the fish to eat it, for you to go eat the fish. <laughs> but um, also one simple way of avoiding plastic waste is at your own small way, I mean, at home is avoiding plastic packaged food. So food that has been packaged either industrially or hot, that food that is being served hot that is carried in plastics will be a simple way of avoiding exposure to microplastics. The rest are global, they are experimental, and it's beyond the individual to go clean the ocean or go clean the soil okay. and get rid of all the plastic here. And plastic um, is just everywhere, like wherever you see, it's all plastic. Yes. <laughs> So the simple way you can do is to be mindful of your own personal disposal mechanism and practices, and also try as much as possible to avoid food package food that is packaged in plastic. Yeah. Prof, you mentioned that um, one of the um, the problems with uh, or ways that um, plastic gets into our food is packaging. Yeah. Um, is there another way that we maybe we can just Scrap out plastic uh, and use maybe something else. I don't know, glass maybe, or yeah. I don't know, a different form of um, packaging and just. Yeah, yeah. In place of plastic, uh, uh, if glass is possible, yes, glass is a safer option than uh, plastic in terms of exposure to microplastics. And in case, other cases like career bags, paper is the best option. Paper is 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 paper not? Um, I think I don't know if I still remember my my chemistry. Paper is made from trees, right? Wood, wood, yeah. Wood. Okay. So the most. So if we use a lot of paper, then we are still in a way harming the environment because we're cutting down all the. Yeah, but paper is environmental sustain environmentally sustainable compared to plastic because. Paper is wood, it's organic, so it can easily degrade. When paper lies down, the microorganisms, the germs will eat on the paper, and then within a short time, it gets mixed up with the soil, and then it goes back to the system. When you put plastic down, it can lie there for years. <laughs> so it's not environmentally sustainable. And with the wood, yes, we can cut wood down, and uh, use it for degradable or environmentally sustainable or green approaches of um, utilization. But remember, we can always do afforestation. So responsible consumption is the word here. <laughs> we can always replace the wood. So you cut one tree, you, you plant three more trees. Yeah. That is the, the most environmentally friendly approach than plastic. There's a lot of talk about using bamboo. Like, I've heard about this, so maybe that can be an alternative. Bamboo? Yeah, bamboo, because I've heard it's easy to yeah, grow. Yeah, it's, it's wood. It's wood as well, yeah. So wood, naturally. Going green. So, yeah, the use of biomass, yeah. that is materials from natural sources, is the way to go. With the, and that brings in the principle of green chemistry. So even in industrial processes and chemical processes, we look at uh, approaches that are not going to harm the environment, that are not going to produce other 
products that are going to cause harm and so on and so forth. It's a new, it's not new, but it's a, an area that is getting a lot of attention these days because of the many problems we are having with the environment, particularly with the release of um, toxic substances and plastic, among others. Yeah, uh, we've also um, heard that there's seven to save the environment before everything just finishes. So, Pardon? Like, uh, there's a lot of talk going about, uh, in, I think New York, there's this talk that is speaking about you know, how much time we have to save the environment. Seven years. Uh, the line keeps breaking. <laughs> so if you can... So, Babel, I, didn't quite, sorry? I didn't quite hear you because the line keeps breaking. Oh, okay, okay. I'm so sorry. Um, I was saying, Babalba, do you have any other questions or shall we conclude now? Hello, Babalba. Yeah, I don't know. Hello. Hi. I was Hello. Saying, do you have any other okay. questions or shall we conclude? Yeah, yes, I do. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, you you um, you talked about um, chemistry. You said let nobody, maybe your parents or anyone, tell you what to do or something. Yeah, my Hello, point. Can you hear me? Was... Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Is that's Tina, right? Hello. Hello. Yeah, Tina, we can hear you. This is Tina, right? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. You you said during the process of um, achieving your goals, you actually plan for um, chemists to go for chemists, right? Yeah, if you if that's what you want to do. So I think she hello. Does, she does not have a good internet connection. So, um, if chemistry is the path you want um, to follow, then by all means follow that path. And then get your parents on your side so that they can support your journey. Yeah. I think I think she does not have a good internet connection, so um, that's why we are having a bit of trouble. So <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello, Tina. Do you have anything else to say? Um, I'm so sorry. Could you, could you just give us a minute? I'm so sorry for the glitches. That's right. Hello? Yeah. Hello, Tina, you're not audible. Um, you're having some internet issues. Um, Tina, can you hear us? Yes. I, I didn't think Tina again. Um, Tina, hello. Okay, so I think she's having some internet issues. So I think we we'll just conclude now. It's been really, really nice talking to you, and I think you are extremely inspiring. And we really need more people like you here to help us. Um, I love the way you're actually working for uh, encouraging girls to come into STEM. I think that's beautiful, and also you're working for the environment, which we all need to. And your uh, microplastic talk. Was I mean, I did not know all of these ways. So, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, that, that is so scary, actually, how we have plastic. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's not too scary. Well, we don't know. So, yeah, we don't know exactly. The, as of today, the, the, the extent of research has, that has been done, we know that plastic on its own contains components that are harmful, 
but the the components that are harmful will have to be released into the body before they can cause harm. But currently, research has not confirmed that when plastic enters your body, those harmful components will be released. So but, that is a safety net we have now. Yeah, yeah but plastic entering <laughs> definitely is a scary thing either way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's been really enlightening for all of us. And I'm sure you, all the girls must watching this would be encouraged to actually go ahead and do something the way you said. Since you were three, you wanted to change the world. I think all of us need that spirit. So I love you and with a quote, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So I think we are all going to take away from this that we have to change the world for the better. So, yeah, I'm great for taking time. I'm getting an echo. Yeah. Um, I think that's too much. Cool. I'm so sorry for the glitches. I'm really, really sorry about the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, this has been presented by the African Girls Empowerment Network. And if you would like to stay connected with us, they, these are our focus areas. We have we work for girls' education, which is our STEM girls initiative. We work for good health and well-being of girls through our age cares initiative, and we uh, work to prevent TB and HIV. And we work for sexual and reproductive health rights as well as child marriage prevention. And we work for women to encourage them to go into governance and leadership, which is our Wet for Women program. And this is a part of our STEM girls initiative for the education. For basically, we encourage girls to join STEM. And obviously, we know why STEM is important for all of us. And uh, I think we have this research that there are globally, there are 80% men in STEM and just 20% women. So we have to change that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. That is our mission for STEM girls to encourage young girls to join STEM. And because I think mentors are really important. And until you see people who've actually taken that journey, you wouldn't be encouraged. So that is our yeah. here to connect women in STEM to girls who want to join STEM. So thank you so much for being a part of this. And thank uh, you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we will upload this on YouTube. So you can uh, check it out and we'll send you a link once it's uploaded. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Hello, Jabu Jay.